clinical on-site reviews with our schools, and we're doing 10, uh, we're doing 15 this year, and we did 10 last year with the title program, and one of the, and these are just a few of the things that we're seeing while we're doing our on-site review. We're seeing that schools are not planning, they're not really looking at the big picture of all the funds that they receive so that they can really leverage the funds that they are getting. We're also seeing that schools are not reviewing their 25 CFR for your ISTEP in regards to classroom ratio. Um, that's important that you look at when you're developing your funds and how those funds are going to be used. We're finding that schools are not getting stakeholder input. When you're planning on how you're going to get, use the funds that you're receiving for ISEF and your supplemental program, what we're finding is that when we do our interviews with parents, administrators, teachers, we're finding that they don't know how the school administrators are going to use those funds. They don't know the plan that's in place. They don't know the goals that the school is attempting to receive. And so that's what we're finding in regards to stakeholder input. They don't know. And so without their input, how are you as a school really developing a plan that's going to demonstrate improvement of academics? Another area that we're seeing is parent involvement. In the same way, parents, parents are giving us the same information that they don't know what the plan looks like. They don't know how SLS funds are going to be used for their students with disabilities. Parents don't know how general ed funds are going to be used for their students. And schools also don't remember to put their set aside for Title I. For example, you should be, as a school, putting aside 10% of your Title I funds for professional development. Um, parental involvement also has a set aside, as does homeless students. So those are all critical components that the school administrator and the school stakeholders need to know about what's allowable and not allowable. The next part, uh, but fourth, is the allowable use of funds. We see over and over again that it appears to be that you're supplanting instead of supplementing. A lot of the, when you look at your plans as a whole, it appears that special ed is paying for the same thing that Title paid for in their plan. So it is no longer where you can just put a budget together and put numbers in it anymore. The Department of Ed is really looking at how our schools in the BIE are improving academic outcomes for our students and how are those funds demonstrating that you're going to improve academic, see academic outcomes with those funds. So it's really critical now that you're really planning in totality how all the funds you receive at your school are going to be used. We're seeing excessive carryover, especially among the tribally controlled schools. And that raises a red flag not only for us, but also for the Department of Ed. And you're going to see a slide in that relation in just a moment. Internal control. You need to follow your internal controls or your policies and procedures in relation to how do you do a purchase order? Are you following what you say your policy says at your school? Are you getting signatures? Are you putting justifications in there? Is it being allocated to the right funds? So it's really important that all this information is not just on the shoulders of a special ed coordinator, that it's on the shoulders of your leadership team, of your school team that's going to determine how are our funds going to be used. And so you can no longer work in silos. I want to repeat that. You can no longer work in silos. You want to be able to use the funds that you have in the best way available. We're also seeing licensed and qualified teachers. However, we're also seeing teachers that are not qualified in the state that you represent and teaching your students. And so that is a finding when we come to your school and your teachers are not qualified. And then what we're seeing in addition to that is that you are not sending letters to your parents saying that your child is being taught 
by a, a non-certified teacher. So it's important that you follow the law and ensure that you're informing your stakeholders what's happening and then how are you going to fix it? What are you going to do to correct it? What do we need to do? Paraprofessionals, again, a red flag when we go out to see fiscal on site. We're seeing paraprofessionals being teachers. And again, that's a finding. If you're not able to find a certified teacher, work as a team to determine how are you going to ensure to the parents, to your stakeholders, that your children are being taught by a certified individual. High school transition services programs are out there. However, they're very, very limited in what they're providing. And so it's something that needs to be strengthened. And I know Dr. Thompson is working on that with the SF. And so for those that are high schools out there, um, it is certainly something that the Department of Ed and we in DPA are really concerned about. Free appropriate public education. We must, we must ensure that we're providing FAPE. It's a free public education, appropriate public education. And again, it goes back to ensuring that our students with disabilities are general ed kids first. Least restrictive environment. We're seeing more and more inclusion. Is that the best place for your children with a disability? Is it working? What needs to change? You have some high needs kids there. Is it working for them to be in the general ed population? Are you seeing an academic improvement? So look at those and discuss it with your team. Contracts. What we're seeing is that contractors are writing their own contracts and therefore writing a, an amount that you, they want you to pay them. No, we want you to be able to write those contracts and you determine whether you can uh, meet the needs of your students and determine if that cost is effective and appropriate for your school. So it's important that you as a school be the lead on those contracts and not the other way around. Child find. Child find is a requirement of the IDEA program, regulatory requirement. We need to see flyers. We need to see posters. We need to see what you're doing to ensure that you're looking for uh, potential or students with have concerns with. Partner up with um, your community. If they're doing a fair out there, put out posters, set up a table. Um, what we're finding is very, very limited and it uh, is something that we certainly can get better at. And finally, your IEPs, your individualized education plans. When we go out and see, do the ISEP, what we do is we look at NACES. We do a desk audit from your NACES IEP. We review what we're seeing as concerns. And then once we're on site at your fiscal on site, we pull random files and determine whether everything is in your hard copy or not. Are we seeing signatures? Are we seeing procedural safeguards? Did the school consider ESY? And if you did, what was the scientifically researched documents that you use or information you use to determine that? Did you in consider behavior? Did you look at um, educational services, assistive technology? So all those things are really critical. So it's important that what we see in me is as complete as possible. And we may have to have, I know that we're working on a new NASIS special ed process guide. And so hopefully that'll help provide further information and support to you as we move forward. So those are just a few of the things that we're seeing on the fiscal on-site reviews. And so it's important that you keep these in mind as you go through. We, the GAO, the government agency of oversight, accountability and oversight, has put the BIE on a corrective action. And why are we on a corrective action? It's because we, were, we are not fiscally monitoring schools with the funds that you are receiving for supplemental programs. And so because of that, which is the result of the fiscal onsite reviews that we're now doing with Title, 
we are working to correct that. And by providing fiscal on-site reviews, not only will we do a desk audit, but we'll also indicate to you any findings that you may have while we're on-site, and then provide any technical assistance that we can provide you based on the information that we're seeing. And that includes a team of the Title I program, the IDEA program, and the school operations, which is the business side. And the three programs, we're looking specifically at supplemental funds because we have to demonstrate that the funds that you are getting for Title and Special Ed are actually supplementing and not supplanting. So it's important. The GAO report back in 2014 says, we found that the BIE does not adequately monitor school procedures using a risk-based approach. And as a result, there's no effective when schools misspent billions of dollars. In addition, the blueprint for reform cited that approximately 125 million in unspent funds have been accumulated over time in the bank accounts of tribally controlled schools. The BIE, this just gives you the copy of the report if you want to go and look at it. But again, this raises a red flag for DPA and the Department of Ed that says, what is the BIE doing with the funds? They're not spending it on sustainability. Oh, gee. I think someone has their cell phone on, or <laughs> we're just getting a few feedback. Just started just yeah. a few minutes ago. So what do we need to do? We need to start planning. We have to develop a comprehensive needs assessment. We have to look at what are our gaps. If you look at your data and determine where your children are and where they need to be, what are your gaps? And then you need to develop your SMART goals from that. And in Title I school-wide school -wide supplemental report, you're going to organize and summarize how you're going to improve academic outcomes for those students, for your students. And then finally, you're going to develop a school-wide budget. So it's important that you start planning, even though the Part B is available now, you still have to plan for your ISEP funds your Title I funds, and then your Part B funds. And so, as we all know, Part B is really um, is related to your IEPs and what's written and the related services <coughs> for your students. So again, your data is important for the comprehensive needs assessment. It's going to help you identify your gaps. This slide is going to provide you some technical assistance in regards to what you should be looking at your student learning, your demographics, your school processes, and your perception of what's happening out there and what's happening at your school in regards to how can we demonstrate that our school is improving academically and how those funds are helping do that. A lot of the schools are purchasing curriculum, but they're changing from year to year. And so it's important that as you're developing your curriculum and how you're going to do that, that whatever you choose, that you try and use it to its capacity. Don't just buy it one year and think it didn't work. Did you use it for what it was intended to do all the way through the process? Then you can make a determination whether you want to proceed or not. So it's important that you're just not buying books or curriculum year to year based on what's working and what's not working. Really research it, really analyze it, and determine how that's going to work in your school. School-wide program. Um, again, you want to look at the school-wide program consists of your base program, which is your ISEP, and then you have to coordinate your supplemental programs into that. That's your Title I funds and your Part B funds. And again, your base funds is your formula. ISEP funds, and it's based on a determination <coughs> from the ADD ERT office and not from DPA. Your supplemental funds are from the Department of Ed, and again, they're supplementing your ISEP funds. So here's a diagram of your ISEP funds that you get. So if this was all the money you got, 
If you look at your funds from ISEP, if this was all the money you received for your school, what would your school look like? And this is where you want to start. And then you also have your 15% ISEP that has to be set aside, and you have your gifted and talented and your LEP NNL set aside. So what does your school look like if that was all you got? That's where you need to start in planning what your budget and what your funds are going to be used for. This is really critical because this is from the, these funds come from the Department of Interior and they need to know that your funds are being used for its base program and the students that you serve at your school. So I said on this slide, speaks to that basically is to provide funding for your elementary and secondary education. And so this is something I'm not going to read, but it's important that you think about this as your leadership team gets together and says, if ISEP was all we had, what would we look like? And then determine what your school can, can and cannot do. Then you're going to look at your ESEA supplemental funds, your title funds. How can these funds help be a asset in your ISEP funds? How can they supplement what you wanted to do? And so you're going to look at those funds and everyone in every school gets Title I funds. We're fortunate that way. And so Title also serves students with disabilities. Remember, because they're general ed kids first. So if you're going to buy curriculum and it's going to come out of your ISEP funds, but you want to buy just one more little thing but you can't afford it, then you might be able to do it with your title funds. If you're going to buy desks for everybody, that includes our students with disabilities, unless they need a specific chair to work with or a certain assistive technology. So this is how you're going to plan ISEP first, then title, which includes students with disabilities. And in, on the following slide is a definition for the title programs so that you can make sure that you're meeting the requirements of these supplemental funds. The first one is Title I, Part A, and it's really on reaching proficiency and challenging performance standards. Funds may be used for supplemental services and activities and most commonly for instruction in reading and math to raise student achievement. Again, the goal is to raise academic outcomes for your children. The next slide, Part A funds, Title I. Again, a school-wide generally uses Title I for any activity that supports the needs of a student identified through a comprehensive needs assessment and included in a school-wide plan. The Department of Ed just recently went on a trip to several schools and they'll, they'll be going to another school. They came with us during the on-site review. And their major concern when they reported back to the director of the BIE was that they stated that just from that example that they went to this year and the two they went to last year, <clears throat> they stated that the schools are not planning school-wide. So, if we could see it, they saw it, it's important that you as a school start planning and in its entirety. And again, eliminate working through silos. Just because a student with a disability is a student with a disability, that that person or staff or um, book has to be bought by special ed funds. You wanna make sure that you leverage your funds as much as possible. And for parent involvement, your set aside is 1% of your Title I fund. So you must set aside 1% for parent involvement when it comes to Title I. School improvement, part B, part two, part A, teacher quality. Again, to increase student achievement by elevating teacher and principal quality through recruitment, hiring, retention strategies, and using scientifically based professional and development intervention. And you must set aside 10% for professional development in this program. So think about how are you going to raise the quality of your teachers that you have there? How are you going to retain them? 
how are you going to recruit and these funds can be used for that purpose. Homeless, McKinney Vento, the set aside is 0.5%. And again, it's for those children that don't have a permanent home. Um, Valerie Totacini is the one that's our contact person for that. And she can be reached here in the DPA office at valerie.totacini at vie.edu. And she can provide you further information if you haven't attended any of her webinars on the McKinney Vento. And some of your schools apply for the 21st Century Community Learning Center. The purpose of this is to help students, particularly those who are attending low performing schools, to meet state and local state academic standards. So this is something that schools can apply for, and it's important that um, I know that when the new grant will be opened up, Valerie will let you know. But it's really important that if your teachers, one of the things that we're seeing is um, we were having a school where a special ed teacher was helping out with 21st century after school. It's critical for you as a school, for the business managers, for the school administrators to remember that if they're going to go into a different program and help other kids that, or all kids, that it's not paid by special ed, that special ed staff doesn't get overtime. It is not a continuation of their job that they were hired for. I recommend that you either pay a stipend if you're a BIE operated school, um, as well as a grant school, you can do a contract or a whatever, or a stipend, but don't make it so that's an overtime. And we're seeing that happen more and more. It's not allowable. It's a separate program. So you want to ensure that there, you can demonstrate that if I worked in special ed for 40 hours and I'm going to go now help title 21st century, that I'm not getting overtime. It stops at the end of my contracted day, and then I'm going to go do another job for the school. So <clears throat> keep that in mind. Suggestions for planning school-wide budget planning. Make sure that you're um, developing your initial projected school-wide budget. The Title I program is going to be posting their application on April 1st. So you should be ready to or start planning now for that and help site start doing your SMART goals, your school-wide plan, your gaps that you're looking at working on, and benchmark reports. So this slide just provides you further information in regards to the Title I program. LEA schools complete the school-wide budget. Again, this slide just speaks to that, but on the second bullet, this is critical when you do your school-wide budget that you include justification. What we're doing is that here in DPA is we're looking at how you're using your Title I funds, and then we're looking at your IDEA Part B funds. How are you utilizing that, as well as your 15% base funds for ICE for special ed? So we're seeing a lot of redundancy. We're seeing that you're going to pay for somebody for RTI in Title I, and then you're going to pay for somebody out of special ed. So our question is, why is special ed paying for it when you're already having Title pay for it? So again, your plan has to be really transparent and holistic and really utilizing all the funds that you have to make it work for your school. So. Remember that we're not just looking at my program in special ed. DPA title isn't just looking at theirs. We're looking at the whole picture now, and we're looking at your ISEP funds. Though we don't oversee the ISEP funds, we have to look at it just to see how you're utilizing it and then how you're supplementing it with the two funds that you receive. What questions do you have? Um, Dr. Thompson, can you unmute everyone? Or do we have any questions at this time? One of the questions is, uh, can the PowerPoint be present now? Wait, hold on. Do I need to do it? No. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead and unmute. Um, there was a question, can the power be printed now? No. Uh, unfortunately, I attempted to try and send this. However, it was too large for it to go to your schools. Your school's computers couldn't hold the capacity. 
So I'm going to put this on the BIE website um, after we get done with this. And I anticipate if I send it up to the DC office, that they won't have it available until tomorrow morning. My apologies. I had hoped I could have sent it all out to you today. Another question is, has the results of the desk audit been sent to the schools? Has the results of the desk audit been sent to the schools? Um, for this year, we did 15 on-site. And for the desk audit, we will be um, sending those out soon. We are now in a new process up in the, from DC. We were informed that before we can do our desk audit, a letter needs to be sent to the school, which is our normal process. Our normal process is if you're a tribally controlled school, we'll send you a letter within 30 days of our on-site visit. And for BIE operated, we'll do as quickly as we can. Um, but for the desk reviews, um, we have to go through uh, now a committee up in D.C. on all letters being sent out by the BIE has to go through a process of being of review. And so hopefully once those letters get sent out, we can send our desk reviews to those other 30, 25 schools that we're going to get desk reviews this year. If you as a school would like a desk review, um, let me know and we can see what we can do in working with our ESC to providing some helpful information in that area. Another question is, when talking about the GAO monitoring, could you explain the risk-based approach? <clears throat> yes. The question was, in regards to the GAO report, they had a question on the risk-based approach. What the DPA did was we developed a risk-based approach this year in relation to um, your size of your school, the amount of funds that your school receives, any excessive carryovers that you indicated through school operations, and also your um, any findings in your A133 audit. We also looked at the special ed documents that you submit to us in regards to your spending plan, your CAU, your CEIS, the FASA, the Fiscal Accountability Self-Assessment. So there were a number of indicators used this past year as a risk indicator to determine which schools would get an on-site visit. Any other questions? Uh -huh. Can you use both funds to cost share for this? I would have to have more detail in regards to cost sharing, but I can give you an example of where you could cost share one that I can think of right off the top of my head. If you have a parent liaison that you're utilizing and using it for Title I, and you're using also a parent liaison for special ed, you could cost share that by showing that 50% of that person's salary is going to come from title and 50% from special ed. That would be something that you could do. <clears throat> That's one that I can think of off the top of my head right now. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and proceed. And um, as I put the video. Um, as he works to move everybody off mute, I'm going to proceed to the next slide. So now we're going to talk about IDEA funds, supplemental funds. So remember, your ISAP is your base fund, title is your next pot of money, and how are you going to use that? And then your IDEA Part B supplemental funds come into play. And this is really critical that you really look again at the whole picture as this diagram shows so that you can utilize and leverage the funds that you receive and are not duplicating and not supplanting what you're doing at your school. There are two sources of funding for special ed. You have a 15% ISA, which is your base fund, and you should really demonstrate that these funds are going to be used by the end of the year. And the reason why you want to do that is because these funds don't get carried over. If you don't use it, they can be sucked back into ISEP and used for other purposes within your school. 
and we really, really would like to see this 15% set aside being used for your students with disabilities. So it's important that you do that. Your second source of funds is your Part B supplemental funding. And it's to be used to, if it shows and demonstrates that you really need supplemental funds because your base 15% is not enough to provide the services necessary for your students with disabilities. And we really want you to focus on what do your IEPs say? What do your students need to be successful? What do they need in regards to related services so that they can have the motor adaptability to be able to walk, to hold a pencil, to be able to feed themselves, to pronounce letters, so forth. So it's important that you use these supplemental funds to demonstrate that they are supplementing and not supplanting. The purpose of IDEA funds, as we all know, is to meet the unique needs of our children and to prepare them for education, further education. Um, we do have some students in higher ed. We want to be able to say to our community that they got a job, they know how to hold a job, they know how to set up a bank account, that we help them learn how to write a resume or do job skills that they're going to be successful in. And then the third one is we want to demonstrate to our community and our stakeholders that they can live independently, that they know how to read signs, that they can function in our communities and be successful out there. So it's really important that our funds are being utilized in these manners. And then the next two bullets is to ensure that the rights of children with disabilities and parents are protected. And local, which is you, local service agency, the school is providing education for all children with disabilities. We also want to ensure with IDEA funds that, and the regulatory requirements that educators and parents have the necessary tools to help you improve educational results. We don't want it just to be the school that does everything for those kids, your children. We want the parents to be your partner. How can you get your parents to be your partner to help ensure educational results for your children? If it's for independent living skills, if you're working with a high needs child that needs to learn how to feed himself, you're doing it at your school. How can your parent partner with you to ensure that what you're teaching there is happening at their home? What kind of training do they need? What kind of understanding of their children's disability do they need to have so that they can help you? Or vice versa, what do the parents, what are the parents doing at their home that they want you to continue? Are they learning how to um, work independently at their desk and work on their projects? What do they need help with? What do they see? That's why that IEP meeting when you have your class and you're talking about all the information and you're getting ready to do their IEP. You need all that information so you can really make a good IEP to demonstrate how you together as partners are going to make this work and become help your student become successful. And also to ensure the effectiveness of efforts that you're providing your children with disabilities. So all of these are the purpose of IDEA and the regulatory requirements. While the fiscal alignment is important, which we talked about in regards to ISTEP, um, OSEP says IDEA requires primary focus of federal and state monitoring to be on improving educational results and functional outcomes. So while compliance is important and fiscal monitoring and the use of funds is important, the most critical area is how are these two products, this money and the compliance working towards improving education of your students. That's the most important because you have the funds, but now you've got to demonstrate how they're using to, how you're using them to improve academic outcomes for your students with disabilities. And as, as I stated, compliance is important, but improving outcomes for our students is just as important. And how are you, 
how is the um, IDE fund being utilized in your school to help improve academic outcomes for your kids? So as you're planning, think about this. How are these funds demonstrating? If we were to get a fiscal on-site review today or next week, how can we ensure that the funds that we're using are going to be used to improve academic outcomes? And here are the guiding questions that you want to ask yourself, especially when you're determining whether to purchase something for a child with a disability or the, for the special ed program. You want to ask yourself these questions. If in the absence of special education needs, would this cost exist? So let's say you're going to buy a desk. If this product was not because of a student with a disability, in the absence of special education needs, would you still have to buy desks? And if the answer is yes, then it is not an excess cost and is not allowable. If it's no, let's say because the desk has to be made specifically for a child, then it is an excess cost and may be eligible to be purchased. So it's important that you ask yourself these next three guiding questions as you're getting ready to purchase things or determine how it's going to help improve academic outcomes for students. The second question, is this cost also generated by students without disabilities? No, then the cost is excessive, is an excess cost and may not be eligible. And yes, the cost is not an excess cost and is not allowed. There's something wrong there. I have to check this one because they're both not. <laughs> so I'll review that one. But the question still remains the same. Is this cost also generated by students with a disability? So let's say you're going to buy mm, curriculum. Is this cost generated by students with disabilities? Not necessarily, no. I would say if you're going to buy curriculum, because they are going to buy it for all the kids across the board, then it would not, it would be an excess cost, uh, would not be an excess cost, so it would not be eligible. But if you're buying a application on an iPad for, that's going to help them because a student can't write, and it's going to help a student with a disability, then it would be in, in excess cost and would be allowed. So these questions just have to be changed around or modified. The third question, if the child is a specific, if it is a child specific service, is the service documented in the IEP? Yes, then it is an excess cost. No, it is not an excess cost. So the third question again is it really as it relates to their IEP. If it's in there, then you can purchase it, but make sure your IEP demonstrates that you've really looked at why that's going to be needed for that child. Thank you. That was slide three. <laughs> Thanks, Elaine. All right. Um, this slide, Part B Supplemental Funding. All Part B funds must be obligated in the year they were received. Now this is a question that comes up over and over again. The money that you receive for this school year start in July 1 and is to be used by June 30th or um, actually September 30th of this coming fall. Though it shows on your FDD that it doesn't expire till next year, it's only because if schools need to adjust credit cards or salaries that this account still stays open for that time period. However, the funds are supposed to be used for it the year that you receive those funds. And here's why. You have 100 children at your school with disabilities. Those funds should be used for those kids that are at your school right now. If you had carryover, then that raises a red flag because it says, what services did those 100 kids not get that they had carryover? So you really want to use those funds that you receive for this school year for those children that are at your school right now. Now I know that you're going to have students that leave and students that come in. 
So you got to use the funds that you receive for those purposes and provide those services to those children <coughs> that are at your school now. So again, the funds must be obligated and used within the year you receive it. And this runs into a series of issues for tribally controlled schools because those funds get rolled over from year to year and based on our on-site visits, it's very, very difficult for the business manager, the technician, and the school trying to spend those funds from year to year. We have schools that don't apply for funds because they have carryover. Or their 15% base funds of ICEP is sufficient. So really look again at your whole plan and determine how are the funds going to be utilized to serve your students with disabilities because it's available to them. Also, schools must su supplement, they must demonstrate, you must demonstrate you're supplementing and not supplanting. And then the use of funds can be used to pay for excess costs of providing education and related services for children with disabilities. I go back to that picture of the ISEP. If this was all the funds you received, what would your school look like? Then you're going to look at title. Then you're going to look at part B. How are those going to all work together to meet the needs of your children at your school? <clears throat> the next couple of slides are allowable costs, IDEA PARP funds. These are just examples of some of the things that you can use them for. Um, one of them is for direct services, such as for ESY, high school transition. Um, you want to make sure that you're enhancing the, its capacity to make free appropriate public education by providing pub, um, real special ed and related services in relation to um, meeting the state standards, including appropriate education for your students and providing a conformity with your IEP. Again, your services with disabilities who are subsequently enrolled and identified during the school year and other permissible activities is child find special education professional development for your special education teachers as well as your general education teachers as long as it's special education related. So let's say for example you want to teach everyone on the procedural safeguards. You can do that and pay for it out of part B but you have to demonstrate that it's just that it's a topic on special ed. So you can do that. Um, supplies, materials and equipment Something that's new this year is that your supplies and your spending plan has gone down. It is now only $500 for supplies and materials because you have to justify how are the funds that you're going to allocate for this area above and beyond what you would buy for general education. So I don't want to see post-it notes. I don't want to see pencils. I don't want to see paper because that's what general ed would buy for all their kids. So if it's a pencil grip, if it's um, a special chair because a child needs to sit in an ergonomic chair, that might potentially be a good example of one. So those are things that you have to demonstrate. And again, I'm going to say justifications are critical when you're filling out your spending plan. Justify it. Look it over. Have someone else look at, look at it. Look at, have your business technician look at it. Does this justifiable? Can I use this when I put it into our web account, web budget, or if you're using your um, own accounting system? Does it demonstrate justification that I can tell why I'm buying this? And so it helps your business manager as well. If your justifications are clear and your allocations are clear, then you guys are both holding each other's accountable in regards to how the funds are being spent. Uh, instructional materials, again, have to be above, above and beyond for special education. And your assistive technology, really look at that, consider that in areas that may be beneficial to your students. Also, look at your hearing and visually impaired children if you have any, or your TBI and autistic children, your real high needs children, because those are critical to ensuring that you meet the um, related services as well as academic outcomes for your students. Okay, 
Part B application is now available in Native Star. It's under the complete tab. And if you scroll down, you're going to find the LEA school year 1718 Part B application available. I recommend, highly recommend, if you've already started it or you're getting ready to present it to the school board, that you have really looked at your whole plan with title funds and your ISEP funds because that's what we're going to look at. We're going to make sure that you are not being redundant in regards to what you're using your title funds for and your ISEP funds for. So really look that over, review it one more time, and ensure that you're making some really good decisions on how you're going to use all your funds that you receive. Schools have three choices in regards to the Part B application. You can choose to select none, partial, or all. And make sure that you check your boxes and review them. I've had a couple of schools where they had <coughs> thought they had checked all, and it came to us as none, and so that school didn't receive any. And then we had to look at the end of the year to see if we could even help them because all funds have to be distributed to our schools that want funding. So complete your IDEA Part B application, present it to your school board along with your plan. I really recommend that you include your title program together so they can see how your supplemental funds are going to support your ISEP funds, ISEP program. And then have your school board your school administrator and your ERC ELO sign that page six and upload it into Native Star. Your spending plan must have justification in them to support what you want to do with your funds. And then you have the optional participation in CEIS and your optional participation in CAU. If the school has sufficient funds with their 15% ISIP and chooses not to select uh, receiving funds from IDEA, you still must submit your application with your spending plan so we can see how those funds are being used and that you're following the IDEA regulatory requirements. So even if you check none, you still have to go through this process and you have to present it to your school board and you have to upload it into Native Star. And remember, in your LEA assurances, your board is signing that you will use such physical control, fiscal control and fund accounting procedures as to ensure proper disbursement of and accounting for federal funds paid to the LEA under the IDEA 2004. So that's critical that they know what they're signing. And who's responsible? That's the school administrator, the special education coordinator, your business tech, your leadership team. Again, it should be everybody involved in developing this plan so that everybody knows how the funds are going to be used. If you get an on-site review and we ask your teacher, how are these funds being used? They can tell us how they're getting used. Um, your school administrator is responsible to ensure that everything is double-checked, rechecked because we don't want to not give you funds if you did want funds and you checked none but was signed and filled out inappropriately or incorrectly, then make sure. I don't want to, if you want need the funds and you can support that it's supplemental, then apply for it and show us that you're, how your justifications are supporting that. Things to remember, ensure funds will demonstrate an increase and improve academic outcomes for your students. Use the fund for its intended pur purpose. Clear and succinct justification. So say for example, you're going to hire a teacher. Write in your justification one teacher for 12, or a caseload of 12 students. Tell us how many those te teachers are working with. Plan with all stakeholders. Funds are to be utilized for the year it was received. And again, demonstrate the funds are supplemental to your ISEP funds. And I've said this before, leveraging your funds is important. It maximizes the impact of available funding. It avoids duplication and it promotes better planning of how available funds can be used to improve results for students and students with disabilities. 
And if you do everything right, and you're planning, and you can look at this, this is not just, again, where you're going to put numbers to a page and numbers to a budget. You're going to really plan, and if you do everything right, your ICEP, your base funds, is going to be supported by all these supplemental funds. And it's just going to enhance the ability for you to really make an impact on your children and your children with disabilities. So again, it's very, very important that you look at every piece of available funds and how are you going to demonstrate that. We are the BIE and all schools statewide not just the BIE, but all schools statewide, the Department of Ed is really, really looking at how our funds are being used. And if you guys have seen the news, we don't know what's going to happen with the Department of Ed and how that's going to affect us at this point. So it's really critical that we are doing the best that we can for our children and demonstrating those funds are critical for improving academics, and you can show it. We need to show that to our parents that we can do this and that we're capable of doing it. What questions do you have? Okay. The first question is to use 15% of Part B for CEIS. Must the school ESS program be performing? Okay. We're going to be, let's see, we are at We are at 2.29 and this session is going to go to 3 p.m. I'm going to cover actually CEIS, so I can answer that question in this session. What about teachers, supplies, office supplies, or special education department? Okay. I am currently updating the office. I am up, updating the allowable cost document. I was working on that yesterday. Office supplies, is it for... Um, if you're going to, if it's going to be, let's say, manipulative that you're going to need to buy for your students to help them learn how to count or to hold it, um, then that's allowable. But for office supplies, like for um, whiteboard erasers or um, markers for your boards, for your smart boards, those would be considered general supplies. Those would be what the school would purchase for all teachers. So look at it from that perspective. What are you going to buy for all teachers? And then from there, determine what would be, could potentially be for Part B, from Part B. So again, it's got to be above and beyond what you would buy for general ed teachers. Okay, another question is regarding Part B funds. Our school has unspent Part B funds from the previous years before the current administration tenure. There is no plan to be found in regards to these funds. What do we do with these funds? Okay. The school has some unspent funds, Part B funds, and is unable to find the plan. So what you're going to do is for this coming year in your spending plan and in your application, you're going to tell us and you're going to indicate how much carryover do you have in your spending plan. And I can do that with you individually. Uh, I really want to focus on the funds part, but how to fill out the application. I can certainly have a separate webinar, especially for the first timers trying to fill in that application. I would like to do separately. But when you go into your spending plan under the Docs and Links tab, the cover page asks how much carryover do you have. You're going to indicate your carryover there. And in the next couple of pages as you scroll down, there are three columns. There's a 15% base fund, there's a Part B carryover, and there is current Part B funds that you're asking for. You have to put in your plan what your carryover is going to be used for. And then, um, indicate that in your justification. So that's what you're going to do. Another question is, when will we know if our school will be eligible to participate in the CEIS program? Okay, your C that's a good question and we're gonna cover that, but for CEIS, in order to participate, you have to be at meet requirements. And then also you cannot exceed the 15%, and I'm going to cover that in the next half hour. And the level of determination is going to be coming out this summer. 
So if you're considering CEIS, I would check CEIS on your Part B application because the application is due May 31st. So um, if you're going to do that, go ahead and indicate it. And then as soon as we find out what your levels of determination are, we will let you know whether you can or cannot participate in CEIS. Copy papers, file folders, even if it's for special ed department specifically? Yes. Yeah. General supply. What about? If it's, for, if it's for copying of IEPs, well, I'll take that back. Yeah. Yeah, I think if it's for special ed, because you're going to have probably have your own copier, most likely, then you can buy your own copier paper for those because you're most likely printing out IEPs because you're going to have to have parents sign, maybe your procedural safeguards, um, those kinds of things. So, yeah, you can do that. My, my apologies. I had to back step there for a minute. What about office supplies needed to create and maintain student special education files? Yes. If it's related to keeping your files in a locked, fireproof safe, then yes. And could you repeat the three columns of the carryover application? Yes. And um, I sure can. In fact, I'm going to go there right now for just a quick moment so everybody can see what I'm speaking to. I'm going to go to native. Oh, I can't. Oh, maybe I can. I'm already on the internet. So let's see if I can do this or not. If not, nope, I'm not going to be able to. The three columns are 15% ISEP, Part B carryover, if you have any Part B carryover, and then the third column is going to be current Part B funds that you're going to be requesting. So you'll have to justify and demonstrate where all those funds are going to go. All right. Okay. All right, let's go on to CEIS. We have schools that are participating in coordinated early intervening services, and one of the things that we're bringing this to your attention is because the Department of Ed is really asking for a lot of information and things that we need to here in DPA have to report to the Department of Education on, um, actually to the Office of Special Ed Programs on CEIS. So CEIS is no, is really becoming looked at critically from above in DC. So it's important that I share some information with you on this CEIS program. Uh, the second document before I begin, I want to add something here. If your school is not planning to participate in CEIS, the second PowerPoint that you're going to see on the BIE website is resources. And I have five resources available to you. It's how to access the Part B application how to access the spending plan, the Native Star document upload guidance, the role of the Native Star reviewer, the Native Star reviewer if they return your application to you, because it's your ERCs that are going to be reviewing your plan before it gets accepted. So there's a step in between you and me. There's your ERC Native Star Reviewer. They're going to review it, provide you some coaching comments, and then return it to you or accept it. And this tells you what happens if it gets returned to you, what's the process next. And then number six, the location of the CEIS plan, if you're planning to participate, and how to input CEIS data into NACES. And so these are your second PowerPoint that you'll receive or that will be uploaded into the DIE website. I didn't want to go step by step on how to open up Native Star and finding documents. I feel that if you need more one-on-one -on -one assistance or group assistance, I certainly can do that separately in a webinar. And again, I'd really like to do that with new special ed staff that have not done this before. Because some of you have been all hats at this and are familiar with it, 
So I'm not going to go step by step over this process. So for those that don't plan to participate in CEIS, please let us know that you're logging off. And thank you so much. And I'll continue with those that want to participate in CEIS. CEIS is to provide guidance to the school and administrators on the CEIS contacts and the appropriate use of the 15% Part B funds for CEIS. And again, it's up to 15% of your funds from Part B will go to general education. So you're saying to us that you're willing to give up to 15% of your Part B funds to general education to do coordinated early intervening services. And you're going to have to be providing accurate and reliable data based on what we have been informed by OSEP that we're going to need to monitor better. So the audience that this is going to really focus on are school administrators, CEI con CEIS contacts, your special ed coordinator, your teacher, um, general ed teacher, whoever's going to be working with this, and then your SAT team. So early intervening services may not use more than 15% of the amount of LEAs received in Part B, which is you, the school, local education agency is the LEA for any fiscal year to develop and implement coordinated early intervening services, which may include financing structures for students in kindergarten through 12th grade with particular emphasis for kindergarten through grade three, who are not currently identified as needing special education or related services, but who need additional academic and behavioral support. <clears throat> Excuse me. So CEIS, is not a special education function. It's just that the school is giving up to 15% of their students with disabilities Part B funds over to general education to help the at-risk kids. So you're, you're going to tell us if you decide to do CEIS that you are going to give money over to general education and that you will know will not apply, you will not be eligible for unmet needs. So that's important for you to know. B, the activities that you implement under CEIS are either going to be professional development or educational and behavior evaluation services and supports that are scientifically based and literally literacy instruction. So those are the two areas that you can use the funds for. Even though it doesn't say for professional development um, what you have to provide, you still have to demonstrate that you're including some type of backup in regards to your professional development in regard how that's going to help at-risk kids. So it's important that it's not just professional development for professional development's sake, but that you have supporting documentation and why this is an area of need. There's nothing in this section that shall be construed to either eliminate or create a right to FAPE. So FAPE must continue. And that the LEA must develop and maintain data and report to us, the SEA, on the CEIS plan. And we can show you how that works. And it's also located under the CEIS resources that I showed a few minutes ago. CEIS, the number of students served on this under this section and the number of children served under um, early intervening, sub intervening services and subsequently received special education related services. You must monitor them for a two year period. That's some, so if you're going to apply for funds for school year 17-18, you have to note them in NASIS <coughs> and then you have to monitor and evaluate them for the following year of 1819. So just because you're doing it for this year 
you cannot not do it for next the following year for 1819. You must monitor them, these children, for two consecutive years. <clears throat> and for professional development, that's the same vein because you're showing that you're going to do professional development to help at-risk children. Then those kids that you identify in that have to show that there was an improvement in their academic outcomes for those students. The coordination, this is really, really critical, and we need to remind you this, is that you have to coordinate this with ESEA funds or Title I funds, because that was what we were seeing when we were doing on-site visits, is you were buying a RTI person for math here, you were paying for someone here, and then special ed was paying for someone here. So your e there has to be coordination with your title programs. Funds made available to carry out this section may be used to carry out coordinated early intervening services aligned with activities funded by and carried out under ESEA. If these funds are used to supplement and not supplant funds made available under ESEA for activities and services assisted under this section. So again, remember I talked about ensuring that you're really developing your whole plan and not develop it in silos. You have to demonstrate that ESEA, you're coordinating with ESEA because then it doesn't, then you'll show that you're supplementing and not supplanting. <clears throat> the CEIS pertains, this pertains specifically to the BIE. Um, the Secretary of Interior allows elementary and secondary children operated or funded by the Secretary of the Interior to use up to no more than 15% of the amount the school receives. Again, this is just emphasis and showing you the CFR on it so that you realize that this is something that's related to the BIE and you can only do up to 15% for K through 12 and that it's got to show um, a coordination between ESEA. CEIS is not a is the CEIS is a general education activity. It's a voluntary up to 15% of IDEA Part B funds. It's a supplemental fund to ensure that services provided are in addition to and not replace or supplant that students would receive otherwise. And again, it's K through 12 with emphasis on K through three. So you really want to capitalize and you need to show that the Title I funds match the 15% or are close to for students at risk. You really want to coordinate that collaboration between the two supplemental funds. If the school is using 50% CEIS funds, then um, it's using, if it's only using the 15% CEIS from, from Part B to do the at-risk program, then you're, we're supplanting and we're not supplementing. So that's important for the school to do. You got to make sure you're planning all your programs. <clears throat> CEIS is not a special education activity. It's not mandatory. It is optional. Again, you're not, avail not eligible for unmet needs if you participate in CEIS and you must provide intervening services to students who are, who are currently identified and needing special ed. It is not for those that are in special ed, basically, is what that third bullet is saying. So the EIS is not for your students in, with disabilities. Okay. Please repeat what you said about not being eligible for Part B if you apply for CEIS. Okay. Did I hear it right? Okay. The question was, did I hear it right that if I apply for Part B, I'm not eligible for CEIS? Part B is something that you can apply for. CEIS is optional. So let's say you get $100 for Part B. If you choose to participate in CEIS, you can give up to 15% of your Part B funds to general education, which would be $150. So $15, yeah, $15. So you can choose to give that money to general education. You are eligible for Part B 
as long as you can demonstrate that your justifications and your applications have been presented to your school board. So I'm hoping that I answered your question. Um, CEIS is optional. You will get Part B if you select all or portion. So, and you can only do CEIS with the current funding that you receive that year. You can't do it with carryover money. It has to be the current year that you get your money. Then you can do CEIS. So could these funds pay 15% of the salary of a behavioral health counselor in the elementary? If you can demonstrate it in title, that this is going to supplement title and not supplant, then you could potentially do that for behavioral counselor. If you can put it, you got to put it in your plan, you have to make sure it's very clear and succinct how your CEIS plan is going, those funds are going to be used. But remember, if you do CEIS, then you're not eligible for unmet needs. And the other thing that happened is one school had CEIS and then they had a student with a disability arrive at their school that was a high need. So I made a recommendation that they pull the CEIS funds back so that they could um, use those funds first and then apply for unmet needs. Yes, Gordon. I think that last question you kind of have to be careful because <laughs> if you're supplementing title monies, remember titles is also for kids with disabilities. So are you going to exclude those children on IEPs from that behavior uh, behavior risk? So kind of be careful with that. Um, that's the point. I think if you have a program, it might be easier. Like if you're working with at-risk students that are not on IEPs, um, that might be easier to, to see. But you kind of have to be careful not to discriminate with a school-wide program or a program that's available for all kids. And mm -hmm. because you're going to supplement it with Part B, you might inadvertently discriminate against those kids on IEP. It's kind of tricky. Yeah, that's true. Good point. I can see that. Why is unmet needs funds not allowable so if, you apply, if CIS? Why are not, why is unmet needs not available if you apply for CEIS? The reason is because you are choosing to give up to 15% of your Part B funds that should be used for your students with disabilities first, and now you're willing to give up to 15% away to your general education. So that would be the reason why. We want to really utilize all of your Part B funds for your students with disabilities first, and then if you feel that you have sufficient funds to do that, then you may want to consider CEIS. And that's the reason why. Another question. CEIS is different from RTI. If our state allows to qualify students through RTI, this process would be allowable and considered different, correct? In the BIE system, um, we have to allocate it because it's optional for the BIE. Um, and not, I, you know, I'm going to have to, yeah. Maybe I can help here. <clears throat> RTI is a school-wide program, and students with disabilities have access to that program. So it depends on how you write it up, whether you're going to inadvertently discriminate against the kids on IEPs if you do not allow them to participate in the RTI program at the school. Again, it's a it's kind of tricky there um, in terms of how you supplement it and how you write it up for that particular um, program. How you're going to set that up? I would want I caution you because the OSEP is really looking at CEIS that we really really justify and you complete your plan as clear as possible so that um, when we have to do our report to ISEP, we can say with confidence 
that you are supplementing and not supplanting and that the CEIS is really dedicated to those students at risk um, because CEIS is optional to the BIE and not mandatory. Um, that's certainly a question I'm going to have to review. I don't want to say um, one way or the other, but I will certainly look into it and talk with our contact up in D.C. in the Office of Special Ed Programs and get some technical assistance from them to give you a more accurate um, information in that regard. I think in this discussion we're using voluntarily um, the use of CEIS for all the 50 states. If they have high rates of disproportionality and over-identification relative to ethnic groups, if they exceed a certain limit, then they are required to use up to 15% for CEIS. But because the Bureau has one unit ethnicity, then the option that is available to us is that it's voluntarily. In other words, we can't mandate a school to use up to 15% of the CEIS. That's the difference there. Now, it may get confused at, be confusing at the school because at the school, they can determine if they're going to use part of their um, Part B for at-risk students, that part of it is voluntary too. So don't confuse the two reasons as how it's stated in the regulations and how you can um, exercise your option to use this 15%. However, in addition to that, the BIE has required the school to be at a level one before they can utilize up to 15% for CEIS and also that if you give up this 15% and you find later that you can't meet the needs of all of your students, then you will not be allocated um, unmet needs because you didn't look at all of your students and they may need that Part B to receive their services. Oh, okay, I'm going to finish this and then um, answer questions because I want to make sure I get through all of this. Um, reporting, uh, part of the CEIS requires that you report your data and here's the CFR that speaks to that on this page 54. And for BIE, uh, the data that we have to collect and report to the data center and to OSEP is did the school voluntarily use up to 15 percent? Um, did they reserve what was the amount that they allocated? Because we have to put that in re the report. So we have to put fiscal data and we have to put student data. So you, we have to put in the 17-18 data and the 18-19 data. And then the total number of students received CEIS and how many students received CEIS in 17, 18, 18, 19 have been evaluated or are receiving special ed data. So these three bullets talk to just student data. The number of students that received CEIS, the number of students that um, received CEIS under Part B, which seems to be the same to me, and then the third bullet, how many students were evaluated and then wound up being a student with a disability, we have to keep track that data too. So your exit and your entering data is really critical in monitoring. So these components are um, really important for what we have to report to OSEP and into the data ed facts. Potential warnings, things that we're seeing. Um, when we do this is if the school went above, make sure you're below the 15% threshold of your Part B current, B current funds. Uh, make sure that the schools are participating in CEIS, that you check the box um, and that you complete the plan in your Part B application, that you, um, you're not identifying, make sure you identify the amount of Part B allocation reserved and that you're not, and then one of the other errors that we were seeing is that the school was not noting the students in the flag section in NASA 
and the resource documents that I spoke of earlier has how to put that information into the flag section in NASIS. Um, the other errors or warnings we found um, was that they, schools were not completing objective four in regards to the spending plan. So you wanna make sure that you're indicating the amount that you're putting into the CEIS. And then you were not uploading a letter into Native Star. Let's say, for example, if you say you're going to do CEIS and you're at a meet level one determination, but then later on decide that you don't want to participate and you want to keep all the students, the funds for Part B with students with disabilities, then all you have to do is send a letter or a memo to us and upload it into the Native Star folder called. Um, school year 17-18, IDEA, Part B, and let me know, and then we will make sure that we take those funds out and not demonstrate that you did put money into CEIS. So you do have an option that if you choose to and then you choose not to, you just need to let me know. Once we give you your level of determination and you find out that you can meet meet your requirements and you do want to participate and let's say come September, October, you decide, no, we're going to keep all our Part B funds for special ed. Then you just need to send me a letter and upload it into Native Star, let me know, and then we'll take you off of that so we can demonstrate to the office and into the EdFax data system that your school did not participate in CEIS. And then from your business manager, we're going to need um, demonstration or evidence that that money was put back into um, your Part B funds. <clears throat> Where will you get the information for reporting um, from the NASA Special Ed Spending Plan and ID application? Uh, we will, from our end, review the CEIS information that your school has inputted. We will ask schools to verify your Part B funding and then the amount you use so that you're not going over the 15%. And if you are, then we will let you know. We will ask the school to verify numbers of students that are participating in CEIS as well as the numbers who are subsequently identified for special education services. So your CEIS process is similar to your Part B application. You're going to um, check the box in your Part B application and complete page three of the Part B application. And then the spending plan, there's a section in there that's um, allocated and divided up just for CEIS. Is CEIS mandatory? These are questions that we've received. No, it's optional. And so it's not something that you have to participate in. Your school is responsible for submitting the plan, putting the data into NASIS module, track your students, and then account for the funds used for this activity. Who will complete the CEIS plan? It's going to be you, the school, the administrator, the leadership team, um, your general education personnel who's going to be responsible for handling this project. Again, this is a shared activity. And these next couple of slides is just walking you through how to find and where to locate the CEIS. So I'm not going to go through it. Um, the last one is print the PDF and present to the school board for approval. So that's part of the Part B application process. Who's responsible for submitting the reports? Again, the school administrator. You want you want to make sure that you're reviewing it, that it's correct, so that what you're uploading is going to be the most current application that you have. Mid-year CEIS plan adjustments. Um, if you, this is just saying that if you during the mid-year, um, you want to make sure that. Any adjustments in regards to less, maybe you give less to CEIS than you, than you thought, then you want to make some adjustments in your spending plan. And all you have to do is just upload your spending plan, make the modifications, and then reload it into the IDEA folder, 
and then let me know so that I can make those adjustments into my documents as well. So that's important if you're going to make any adjustments, whether it's to CEIS or to the CAU plan. And a reminder, and I'll put this out, I didn't say this earlier, but um, your current adjusted Part B plan, spending plan, is due at the end of the month. So you should know it actually where all your funds were going to or are going to that you received. They're due into the IDEA plan. Okay, what should the decide not to implement? Again, I said this earlier, you're just going to write a letter on school letterhead describing the reason the school will not participate, present the letter to the school board, get their signatures, the school board signature, the school administrator signature, and then let me know and then post it the letter in Native Star as letter not participating in CEIS. So you do have that option. You don't, you can change your mind and find out, I really do need those funds for our students with disabilities and I'm not going to be able to do that. But you make sure that everybody's informed that that's going to happen. The next couple of slides are best practices. Um, questions that we worked with our TA providers and in reviewing the CEIS plans, these were some of the questions that you want to ask yourself for question three, describe the CEIS program and include scientifically research-based strategies and interventions. That's the key. If you want to do research-based, you have to demonstrate and show us and describe what scientifically research-based strategies are you going to use when you're doing your CEIS plan. And you have to describe the CEIS entrance and exit tool and the criteria of how students will be identified. So these are two areas that our schools in reviewing our CEIS that we need to strengthen and you need to strengthen if you plan to participate. So this is just a plan to do a study cycle just to give you an idea of a best practice on how you can review what you have, whether you really want to participate in CEIS, you really need to plan and we talked about that, and then what actions are you going to take. And then study what you've done and is it working, is it not working, how can you make it better. Here are some critical questions. Who are the students that are not experiencing success? Why are the students not experiencing success? Why do we have the data that we have? What are the barriers? What barriers appear to be top priorities? What resources do we already have? And what resources do we need? So think about these questions as you're developing your plan because it'll help you determine whether you're supplementing versus supplanting. Four simple questions that you can ask yourself. Who cares about this issue and why? What work is already underway? What shared work could unite us? And how can we deepen our connection? <clears throat> An intervention must connect, must match the student needs, must have specific step-by-step -step descriptions, must include ongoing progress, address training, fidelity, and coaching, and also allow scheduled periods of support. What do interventions look like? Each component of the intervention should be clearly defined. A practice profile can be used in defining essential components of interventions. And this is going to a question someone had. If you can print, when you print this up, you're, when you're doing CEIS, you're really focusing on your level tier two section. You're at risk kids on both sides of the pendu of the dog, the, the triangle. So when you're doing CEIS, again, you're looking at at risk kids, kids that don't have IEPs. You're really focusing at your risk on, on the academic side as well as the behavioral system side. So just this is just a diagram to help look at that picture in a different way. 
And then when you're working on CEIS, you need to ask yourself, are the interventions working? You have to plan and to collect the information that you did. You have to distribute it. You need to analyze it, study it, and then respond to the data that co is collected. And then you need to ongo continue to um, monitor it as you progress and continue to monitor it as it's ongoing. So you can really see if what you did is really making a difference in regards to those students at risk. All right, do we have any questions, Jean? Okay. We have, um, I will respond to your questions and share it with everybody. Um, our time is now past, eight minutes past. So I appreciate everyone's participation and the questions you brought to our attention and I will respond accordingly. And please, again, if you are a new staff member and need help on how to use Native Star and find the application and the spending plan, please let me know. I'll be glad to do a group webinar for all the new staff on how to proceed. Again, plan, plan, plan. Um, make sure you're supplementing versus supplanting. And please contact me if you have any questions. Thank you.